So how do we make progress? Does that tell us that the exercise itself is just uh, enjoyable for late night uh, bull sessions, but has no real substance to guide us? People are interested in these questions. People persist in thinking about them. If you're going to think about them, you might as well think about them well. Part of what thinking about them well means is knowing what the options are. Mm -hmm. For instance, if, you really, if it's really worth your while to consider a question like whether God exists or whether the mind is separate uh, from the body or whether mathematics describes a reality that's different from physical reality uh, or uh, whether the will is free, uh, if it's worth having opinions about these mm -hmm. questions at all, it must be worth knowing what, uh, for example, the possible objections to your uh, opinion are, the objections that actually have been offered and taken seriously. It must be worth your while to know what the arguments in favor of it. It must be worthwhile knowing what the distinctions are. You say you believe in free will. Are you aware of the different things that could be meant by uh, the term free will? So I would say there's a great deal of progress in philosophy if it means progress in finding out what the relevant considerations are uh, and progress in clarity, in precision. Uh, things get better and better all the time with that. What there isn't progress forward in philosophy is consensus of opinion. One of the things that you said, which I think we, we do make progress, is realizing that there's a way to distinguish the, rea the, the reality from the appearance, that there are many things that appear one way, but that further work can reveal a deeper reality that differ from that appearance. And so even though you may not have agreement on what that reality is, you do have agreement that reality is different from the appearance, which is a fundamental uh, realization of itself. Yes. I suppose um, many people, you know, I don't like to accuse any particular people, never think about the difference between appearance and reality. No, they assume that things are pretty much as they seem to be, and it's for those things that are outside the range of their perception or thought, for them, <clears throat> those things might as well not exist. You know, they don't think about them at all. But from the very beginning, well, I mean, the first um, person that history describes as a philosopher in the West, at any rate, in Greece is Thales, who said that everything was water. Well, he was trying to answer the question, what are things made of? And he thought that maybe different things are all water in different forms. Water is the sort of undifferentiated form of things, and it gets put together, compacted, arranged differently in different things. I mean, as a theory today, we know that that's of no value, whatever. But I mean, look at it as, as the invention of a question. And this is a question about appearance and reality. You know, water is both apparently water and really water. <laughs> this chair, he thought, was not apparently water, but was really water. Yeah. Um, so right from the beginning, you have that appearance-reality distinction. I think this brings up the whole issue of, of, of parts and wholes, and what's a part and what's a whole. I mean, we, we think chairs and things are separate things, but now we know from science that they're made up of, of finer and finer atoms and subparticles, quarks, mm -hmm. or whatever. So we, we have the whole issue of, in, in trying to discern reality, what's a part and what's a whole. How do, we, how do we make progress there? Holes, of course, are just things made out of parts. So the, whole, the, two, the two things take in each other's washing. You could just ask the question, what is it for something to be a part of something? And that's an awfully good question. I think it's a question that has no answer in the sense that part is a term that can't really be defined. Now, some people um, have thought perhaps that a part was something that occupies only some of the space uh, that the thing of which it's a part <laughs> occupies. But that can't be right, you know, because there could be two kinds of matter that only weakly interact, and they could interpenetrate each other. Mm -hmm. A neutrino, for example, can pass serenely through an atomic nucleus, but it never becomes part of the yeah. atomic, even though it's occupying part of the space that the nucleus uh, occupies. Um, I don't think that well, I think part is one of these things where we all know what it means, uh, but we can't define it simply because it's one of the terms that is so basic that it figures uh, in all, uh, in, it has to, 
be appealed to in definitions, but it can't itself be given uh, a definition. The interesting metaphysical question about parts and wholes is what do the properties, what are the relations of the property of the whole thing uh, to the properties uh, of its parts and the relations among the parts? Another subject is, uh, is, is what, it's everything. Is, is everything just one thing with different forms? Are there different things in the world? How many things there are? Uh, some have believed that, it, that uh, everything is mental, so there really are no things uh, that are physical. Uh, how, how do we deal with those issues? Oh, you raised uh, a lot of different <laughs> questions uh, in quick succession. Can everything that is the whole of reality be treated uh, as, a, as a single thing? Um, that's a question I don't know uh, the answer to. Um, the question whether everything of the sort that we can observe can be treated as a single thing, um, that's an interesting question because if you think that everything has a cause, then it follows that everything that we observe taken as a whole as a cause. Mm. But if you think that everything that we observe is just a lot of different things that don't form a whole, then that principle that everything has a cause can be observed even though there's no cause outside that system of things. Each one is caused by something inside it, within the, the system. system. So that's an excellent example of how, the, uh, of how this seemingly metaphysical and abstract uh, question of interest only to specialists, whether reality as a whole can be thought of as a single thing, interacts with the principle uh, that everything has a cause, which many people uh, accept to produce very different answers. If you think of reality as made up of, of the reality we observe as made up of many different things or uh, one single thing of which those things are parts. So what seems to be a very abstract uh, philosophical issue of only interest to specialists really has impact on everything that we can conceive about in terms of, of, of what we're all about. Most people would think that questions about what we're all about, if they're not going to be answered by the question, is all this caused by something that's not part uh, of all this? That's not going to settle the answer to that question, but that should be an important part mm. of what the answer uh, is to it. A theist is going to say it's extremely important uh, to our conception of ourselves, to a correct conception of ourselves, that we realize that all this is caused by something outside it, and an atheist will say it's extremely important to our conception of ourselves to realize that it's not caused by something uh, outside it. Which makes the question so important, even if there's no answer that we can discern. Even if there's no answer that we can discern, in the sense of proof, there's still going to be theists and atheists and people who hold other sorts of positions that are inconsistent uh, with both of these <laughs> questions that imply things about the ultimate causes of things. People don't refrain <coughs> from, be <coughs> from believing things simply because uh, their beliefs can't be proved. Which makes metaphysics something that's terribly germane to deal with the fundamental subjects of reality, including theology. Hmm. Every theologian is at least... I mean, if the theologian is actually somebody who holds theological views, every theologian is partly a metaphysician. I mean, the theologian still has to decide. Uh, even a Bardian uh, theologian um, has to decide what the status of revelation is, has to step outside the system of revelation and come to these conclusions about revelation you know, the value you give to revelation is not, can't itself be a product of revelation, or mm -hmm. the whole system would be circular.